want to, today I'm going to talk to Lo Breitenbach, and Lo Breitenbach is the owner of a theater house in Boxburg, of all places. He's the director of the National Arts Association. He is a performer. He's a writer. He's published two books so far, one of them called Se Yo Se. It's somewhere in the back behind me. He's a social media influencer, and he's just released a documentary, which I watched last night, called The Lowdown on Depression. What it feels like is smiling when you're going through hell. It's like carrying a ton of bricks around you, feeling like you're drowning the whole time, and hoping that you're gonna make it out alive because you live with the constant threat of your own extinction. is baie beter, alhoewel ek my hele lewe depressie gehad het, maar nie gebeet het. I am who I am because I was in denial. You're fat, you're ugly, you're worthless. I am who I am because I was bullied. Put your big girl pennies on and deal with it. You're not allowed to be soft. Daar jare het hulle gedink depressie is, is a opgemaakte siekte. I am who I am because I was molested then something major happened that changed my life forever. And I am who I am because I have depression. It's not just my story. It's your story, your friend's story, or a family member's story. And that's why I want to speak to Lo today. So although he's got this great CV, he's also a guy who speaks very openly about his struggles with his mental health, his struggles with some of the stories that have happened in his life and how he's bounced back. And one of the things that when we speak about resilience, resilience is two things. Resilience is finding your inner strength and resilience is about bouncing back from things that happen. And in a book um, by Rick Hansen called Resilient, he speaks about one of the best ways of being resilient is about being generous. And I found the documentary incredibly generous. And that's why I wanted to speak to Lo today because he's very generous in the information he shares about himself, about being resilient, about not necessarily coping, um, and so we're going to talk about that and also a little bit about the help we're living in with COVID. So I'm going to introduce you to Lo. Thank you so much, Clive, and thank you for uh, providing a platform to talk about uh, this. I think uh, during a lot of inner strength to get through this on the other side and hopefully uh, all of us make it there. But um, yeah, I think it's such a beautiful thing when we are able to take hands and talk about things like this openly and say that your voice matters too, no matter how alone you feel, especially during lockdown, um, that that matters too and that you're not actually alone, even though it feels that way sometimes. And you actually live alone. So you've done this yes. whole lockdown thing by yourself with your, I've seen on social media, your Dalmatian. So first of my Dalmatian is almost human. So it like counts as a loan plus a half. <laughs> but um, I think for me, uh, because I'm a bit more of an introvert, um, I actually like the fact that I could switch my phone off and I didn't feel obligated to go out and go to events. Um, so the first week or two of lockdown, it actually felt like a relief that I didn't have all these obligations of having to go on social media. I didn't have to attend functions. I didn't have to do work meetings. We could just Zoom for a quick uh, in and out and uh, you can type up an email and be done with it. I think where it became more difficult is when you start missing people that you love, when it comes to my parents and especially in the beginning when you can't visit in anyone. Um, that's where you start getting in your head a little bit. But I decided uh, from the get-go to use this time as a way to reinvent myself and a way to um, really find out what matters in this time. Because I think the biggest thing was it's not that we don't have control anymore. It was 
that our illusion of the control we thought we had over life was shattered because suddenly um, your job is at stake, your family and friends is at stake, your social life is at stake. And there's so many factors that you need to filter through and go, okay, what actually matters uh, during this time? Because one of the things that I've, we spoke about in a previous episode was is that that the lockdown or this period that we're in where things are so different is actually a period of opportunity because it is an opportunity to see things differently. When we're stuck in the mundane, the normal day-to-day, everyday lifestyle, yeah. we kind of are fine. But when we're forced out of it, we can either spiral into despair or choose to take a look at life through a lens of saying, I'm going to reinvent myself. So how did you actually go about doing that? I think it uh, it started with my dad, of course, uh, is a pastor. So the ultimate form of positivity always up to a point where it sometimes even irritates. <laughs> but he sat me down uh, very early on uh, and basically said to me that when else in your entire life, he is now uh, just over 60, where else in your life will you get the opportunity to actually pause and think, what do I want to do today? And have no obligation for anything that you have to do. And um, that stuck with me because I thought that, yes, of course, there's admin stuff you do and uh, there's certain things that you do. But if you were not an essential worker, you had that opportunity to stand still, whether it was for a day or two or for a week or two, up until your industry became uh, recognized to continue with work. You had a small window of opportunity to stand still and say, how do I redefine myself and what do I want to be in future? And am I happy with where I am at the moment? And for me, that was the biggest thing is to say to myself that I'm not happy where I am to admit that, like, listen, there's shortcomings, there's stuff that I don't like, there's a mundane routine to my daily work that I absolutely hate. And I think that's why the first week of lockdown felt like freedom, because there wasn't the obligation of doing this. And then I went, but why am I doing this if I don't like it? And um, that kind of lit a fire under my butt to go, okay, well, if this is not what you want, what do you want and how do we get there? I went to the most elementary thing that you could probably do and I literally drew a little spidergram of uh, what do I want to achieve and what do I like about my life at the moment? And just to kind of, because my head is all over the place. So for me as a creative to try and make sense of everything, I literally drew a little diagram with those little spider legs that goes out to say, this is what I'm happy with and this is what I want to change. I want to now talk a bit about your mental health. In The Lowdown, you speak about your mental health. Unpack that a little bit for me in terms of your your journey with your mental health and how is how have you been resilient in this journey with dealing with, you speak about being depressed, um, And also during this lockdown, I'm sure you've had moments of that. How have you dealt with it? How have you bounced back or found your inner strength? I think uh, mental health has been such a big part of my life. Um, At uh, 12 years old, for the I went from psychologist to psychologist. um, And then after being labeled a moody teenager, they realized that, oh, wait, he has chronic depression (laughs) and he's on the bipolar spectrum. And then as I grew up uh, between the ages of 15 and 16, um, I had an ordeal with uh, molestation and uh, I was bullied a lot at school in my earlier years. So for me, I thought all of this was normal. My anxiety, I just thought everyone's anxious about going out and everyone's anxious about having lunch with a friend. I just thought that's <laughs> that's how things go. And um, then last year, I had a major car accident uh, that I was involved in. That actually was a bit of a tipping point for me in my mental health because 
I've been from psychologist to therapist to psychologist to therapist throughout my life. And I thought that I dealt with everything. I was in a good space last year. I'm like, I'm healed. I'm there. I'm like, and I'm like, I'm the advocate for mental health and all of that. I've got my green ribbons, you know. So before the accident, I thought like I'm clear and away. After 10 years of dealing with this or 20 years of dealing with this, I'm now uh, expert in mental <laughs> health and what the accident did um, obviously there's a lot of bad that came with it but in a good sense it opened up everything that I hadn't deal with and I think that's something we like to do as humans is pretend that we're okay when we're really suffering on the outside because we see suffering, A, as weakness, and B, we see it as something that we don't want to burden others with because they are already dealing with so much. Yeah. So we almost put ourselves in this prison of not wanting to talk about it, not wanting to deal with it. And what it does is it becomes this little thorn under our skin. And at first, it's just a little prick. It doesn't bother anyone. We're dealing with it. We're just having a bad day. And then that wound starts getting infected. And instead of just taking out the thorn and going, oh, I have an issue that I have to deal with, we slap on a plaster. Now we leave it for a month or two. The sun shines again. We're happy. And after a while, that thing becomes infected. And after a year or two of dealing with uh, mental health problems, we go, my entire body is infected. I'm on the verge of collapse. I've got a fever. I've got infection. My hand's falling off. And we never realized that we just needed to take a moment to go, oh, wait, I have a problem and I need to deal with this. And the moment you speak out about it, you'll realize that more people and more people are dealing with it. So for the first time in my accident, when I spoke about um, my journey, I realized that A, there's so much that I didn't deal with, and maybe COVID is the perfect opportunity to take a step back and reevaluate everything that I've gone through and ask myself how it's influenced my health, how it has influenced the people around me, and one of the things that I uncovered was actually a beautiful quote by Oprah, where she said she always thought that it was a bad thing to be full of yourself, or it was a bad thing to look after yourself, or it was bad to place yourself and your own needs ahead of others. And then she says in that interview, she says that only when you put yourself first, only when you look after your own mental health, only when you are full on the inside, only then can you give to those around you. Because what I love what you're saying is the importance of talking about it. When you talk about, we just put that little plaster on it. And I think that's one of the things, your documentary that you've done, that you put out there, The Lowdown on Depression, is very raw. Um, and I think de why I loved it and wanted to speak to you is because what I think it does is it allows other people to have the same conversations because it says it's okay to talk about these things. And it's one of the things we learn in resilience is the only way to bounce back or to find inner strength is to be able to acknowledge, is to be able to say, this feels shit. <laughs> this should not have happened to me. Yeah. This is awful and I need to speak about it or I need to, to care it. And that's what I thought the, and you interviewed other people in the, in the documentary. And what was so striking about them was they still spoke from such a place of pain, but such a place of inner strength. And I think that that's what's beautiful about resilience is because it's like a muscle that we learn and it doesn't take away the fact that you went through all those things, the fact that you, you know, you yeah. were hurt. People did stuff to you they shouldn't have done to you. You were in an accident where people lost their lives and you've carried that. But the only way to deal with that is to not deny it, but is to feel those feelings, but also to speak about yeah. them, allow them to become something that's a lot less, uh, you know, kind of infected to use your analogy of the plaster. And I think the beautiful thing uh, with resilience that you are referring to is, and the fact that 
all of the people interviewed in the documentary still experience pain is I think there's a common misconception um, amongst mental health advocates that you think that the moment you start speaking about it or you go on medication or you go see a counselor, you start thinking, oh, I'm fine. It, we forget that this is an illness that you live with throughout your life. And it doesn't heal you necessarily uh, completely when you start speaking up, but that's the first step into becoming resilient and coping with this and saying, I'm stronger than my illness and I'm not defined by my mental health. It's part of me, just like um, for me being a gay male, I'm like gay is part of me, but it's not all of me. I'm not 24 seven, the same way mental health it needs to become, if you want to become resilient, it needs to become routine. It needs to be something that you work on daily. Um, little days, something like a silly like, positive affirmations, turning off social media after an hour of strolling, and those little morning routines that you do every day, that's what makes you cope with your anxiety and cope with your depression. And that's what makes you resilient so that you can go every time I see this pattern and I know this destructive behavior that I have. So the moment you call out your own patterns, you gain the inner strength to go, I'm not going down that rabbit hole again. Because the moment you start overthinking, overanalyzing, and woe is me, then we ignore all the warning signs and we ignore all the progress that we've already made um, in our mental health battle. So the only way you can become resilient is by applying discipline to your uh, mental state and going, I'm putting my phone away. And then I'm like, okay, onto a positive talk or friends that make me feel good about myself or eating food that brings comfort and joy or just walking with my dog outside or walking around my block and doing stuff that really makes me happy. You're quite in the, the, the documentary, your response to the accident. And for those who haven't watched, the accident re resulted in fatalities. And your initial feeling in the voice notes you left was is that you felt responsible for this yeah. and for what had happened. So you had that initial reaction, which was, I think, completely natural. Mm -hmm. And watching it was very hard to watch. It was a heartbreaking response. How have you then dealt with the response to it since then? Because in the, in the documentary, you speak about what happens. But how have you got to a place of now being able to speak to it from a place of you don't speak from a place of pain. You speak from a place of being quite adult about it. How have you gone on that journey of resilience to get to a place of saying, this is what happened, this is what it is, and this is how I've dealt with it? Um, I'm so glad you call it a journey because that's exactly what it has been. When this accident happened, it shook my entire world. I was... Um, not to sound arrogant at all, but I was literally living my best life. And I thought, this is what I've been working for my entire life. I mean, the Tuesday, I came back from a month long trip in Atlanta, and we set up all these amazing contracts with overseas theaters, and we're going to do educational theater. And this is what I've been working for. And then, um, the Wednesday, I had the accident, and the Thursday, I had to fetch Americans coming to South Africa to, to continue our meetings. And for the first week, I had to basically pretend like nothing was wrong. I didn't get that. Um, I cried, and on the voice notes I sent that evening, I was shattered. And that Thursday when I woke up and I realized that, oh my word, I'm on the front cover of the Beeld, um, the Afrikaans newspaper, I was like, uh, okay, what do we do now? And the most human response, I think, for any of us is the moment your world falls apart, we try to sticky tape it together by showing nothing's wrong, nothing's going on yet, everyone just moves along, you know, <laughs> nothing to see here. And that was my initial response after the complete and utter panic and pain that I felt that night is 
I was shattered on the inside, but on the outside, I just tried to get through the week. I was like, if the Americans can just go back home because they stayed with me in my house. And I was like, if they can just go back, then I can deal with this. So for a week, I kept a very brave uh, face on and I didn't want to speak about the accident. I didn't want to engage in it. Uh, there's a part where my dad talks about it and he said that I told them eventually just to like back off. I know people died. I know this is horrific. I know it wasn't my fault, but it feels like my fault. I didn't plan this. So just let me deal with it in my way. And part of that resilience journey is going that it's okay if some mornings you wake up and your only accomplishment is the fact that you woke up. You don't even have to get out of bed. You don't have to feel good about the day. You don't have to go to gym. You don't have to uh, make food. If you can get up, some days that is enough. And having grace and compassion um, for yourself is part of allowing those little moments to be part of your healing. Because eventually, um, I know in the, in the documentary, it seems like something that happened quite fast where I got to a place to speak about it and uh, be okay with it. The truth is completely get over something like that. In, I mean, I had my massive breakdown uh, while we were busy filming the documentary in November and December. That's when I had my actual breakdown. And for the first time in 11 years, I had to go back onto medication and very strong medication at that. I had to go back to therapy. And my first response in November was not that, at first, why am I going back to a psychologist? Why am I going back onto medication? It was almost as if I disregarded everything that happened to me and took the blame of going, oh, I failed because I need to take medication. And that's the stigma that I would love to break around mental health um, or even mental illnesses or mental difficulties is that it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to go on to medication. It's okay to see someone, whether it's a counselor or a psychologist or a close friend that you need to speak to. It's need, you have to, it's needed to speak out about it because that's where your strength comes from. And the more and more and more people I spoke to, the more okay I became with telling my story. The first couple of weeks, I didn't want to get out of bed. Eventually, I got out of bed and I made breakfast. And that was okay for week three and four. Eventually, after that, I was like, after a month and a half, I only went back to gym. And after that, um, I took a month off from my work just to say, I can't work right now because I can't give my best. I need to figure out what's going wrong. And I'm the counseling session after counseling session because you need to be able to speak about the things that hurt you. And maybe just some advice, something I practiced um, was the times where I wasn't okay with speaking to someone, I kept a journal and I just wrote it down in the journal just so that... Um, I'm trying to think of how I can explain that, but just to almost take the emotion out because otherwise all those emotions build up and build up and build up and suddenly you just explode. Mm. So to ease that emotional build up, before I was okay with talking to someone, I built my resilience by writing it down. Mm. And after jotting it down, I was like, okay, but maybe I can read it to someone on a voice note. And then I read it to the counselor on a voice note because I wasn't yet in a place where I could see her face to two weeks. I went to my first meeting with my home, gave me extra steps that I, I can try and include. But it's all those small baby steps of going from writing to sending a voice note to talking about it and then actually going to seek professional help and then afterwards we completed the documentary only in February after giving me two months to go oh okay this is my yeah. new normal and I have to deal with it if I'm going to survive this thing called life 
and it starts with making a decision of, I want to be here. That's the first thing you need to do is, I don't feel like being here. And I still get days like that where I go, Lord, just <laughs> come fetch me like I'm done with this place. You know, it's, it's a continuous journey. But in the back of my head, no matter how bad things get, I made a promise to myself that I'm going to fight till I have nothing more to give. And there were so many mornings where I thought I had nothing more to give. And if you can just celebrate those small victories of getting up, making breakfast, over a period of time you go, oh, wait, I'm dressing for work. I'm going back to work. I'm engaging with people. And the more baby steps you take, the more... Uh, the more ground you cover. And before you know it, you go from a crawl to a walk to a sprint. And that's the, the beauty of resilience is sometimes you go from a sprint straight back down to crawling and wanting to be in your bed the whole day. But because you know you've done it once before, once before I ran around the block, you start taking those baby steps once again. And every time you do that, it gets easier first of all what you're saying which resonated with me is the fact is is that it's okay to be those days where you can't get out of bed um and you know and then the next day you do get out of bed one of the things that we need to realize is, is that what resilience is and why resilience is so powerful is resilience says i know i can't get out of bed today but i can't stay here um and that's what you're saying as well is i have to start making a move so even though I might be 30 kilos overweight, I don't want to stay here. So what do I do? I start making one little change in my life. And that's what resilience is. And what we need to do in resilience is allow ourselves to go on exactly what you're saying is that journey of being able to say, today I'm going to allow myself to do this. Today, and then, and then sometimes the journey is as well as saying, I need to go back to what I thought was okay and fall apart all over again and have the November breakdown, but I need to now not stay there. And that's the power of what you did. Yes. Because once again, you said, I need to speak to someone. You chose to then bring in, you know, that you, you got some help with medication. All of those things were because you decided I can't stay here. And Absolutely. I think that's such a powerful statement in resilience, is resilience is a decision to say, I don't want to be where I am, but yes. I accept where I am. I live Absolutely. in this moment and right now I cannot get out of bed, but I choose not to stay here. Depression yes. is when you stay there. I think that mm -hmm. for, I'm not a psychologist, but yeah. that for me is what would define depression is when we stay in that place. And sometimes we need major help to get out of that. And if we can't yeah. get out of that place, scream for help. And you know, the, that's why documentaries like what you've got are important. So I want to head towards wrapping up because obviously there's only so much bandwidth people have. So of first of all, I want to just say thank you for what you've brought to the conversation. I think that what, you know, it's in, in these discussions I've had is, is that I've, I've realized that there's certain themes that we all have is that, you know, in resilience, there's certain things that we all, you know, it's about being kind to ourselves and it's stuff that we hear about that, you know, I could write an article tomorrow and you could read it and go, yeah, I know. Yeah, we must, we must reach out, we must do those things. And I think yeah. what's so powerful about what you've, what you've done and the journey you've gone on is, is that you don't tell us what we should be doing. You tell us how to be because you've chosen to tell the story very honestly and very rawly. And I want to applaud you for that because I think that stories heal stories. Um, and I think that that's the power and I hope people will, will get to see your documentary, um, and, and be able to, to find out a bit about how they can see the, how, how they can find healing in their story through the, and you don't present healing, you present struggle. And I think in presenting struggle, you find healing. So I want to end with that, but I want to find out, is there anything you want to say, anything takeouts that you've had since you filmed the documentary about resilience, about depression? What, what has been kind of your journey since then and something to leave our, our viewers with? I think um, one thing, um, I, I knew it while we did the documentary, but something, and we've mentioned it before, but it's just one thing that I want to reiterate and say, 
that part about having grace for yourself and allowing yourself to go through the struggle. We're sometimes so scared because we see this dark passage in front of us and we do everything in our power to avoid going down that darkness or avoid going down a dark road. And I want to encourage whether it's a viewer or someone who listens to us or someone who watches my documentary to go through that darkness and embrace your struggle because the moment you go, you know what, what happened to me was unfair, it was hurtful, um, it's something I feel ashamed about, it may be even something I caused. But the moment we can accept that darkness, we can find the light. Because we always talk about being healthy, being mentally aware, being in the moment. But none of us know what lies through those dark patches. So by embracing your darkness and embracing your struggle and going, I need sometimes even if you need to hold someone's hand or you need the help of a counselor or a psychologist to walk through that darkness, you cannot embrace life if you don't know what that darkness is, what that darkness feels like. And when you embrace that, that's when your healing actually starts. Yeah. And it's a continuous journey of daily saying, today I'm going to embrace my fears. I'm going to embrace the struggles. Lord knows I'm going to embrace COVID, but I will get through it. <laughs> and, and if you can live with that attitude, I think it, it doesn't make life easier but it makes it bearable. And that's the human experience. If we can bear the burden, we can find the light. Amazing. And I think that's a great way to end it. If you can bear the burden, we can find the light. And absolutely. And I think this is hopefully these videos and your discussion and your documentary just help people to bear the burden just a little bit lighter. And even if it's just one area of their lives, our job has been done. So, Lo, I want to say thank you for the time that you've spent with me. You have been massively mm -hmm. insightful. I think I could talk to you about this kind of stuff for hours. So, <laughs> thank you thank for you. being a part of this discussion. And, um, yeah, I'm sure everyone has appreciated it.